Hey students, uh, here is this uh, video on chapter 18, which is electric charge and electric field. This chapter actually sets up the foundation for six to seven chapters to come, where we will talk about current electricity, magnetism, electromagnetism, etc. So these are fundamental topics here. Now we do know that all materials have charges in them because in the nucleus we have protons which are positively charged and around the nucleus we have electrons revolving in particular orbits. So all materials are electrically neutral because they have an equal amount of protons and electrons. But it is possible to charge a material by removing electrons. Now the removal of electrons can be done in three ways. We're going to talk about it as we go into the chapter. But first let us look at the nature of charges. And this also brings about a fundamental principle called the conservation of electric charge which states that electric charges cannot be created or destroyed. We can only transfer electric charges from one material to another. So if you remove electrons from a material, it becomes positively charged. And if you add electrons to a material, it becomes negatively charged. So there are two types of charges. One is positive, the other is negative. Now what do you mean by positive and negative charges? Basically, electrons are negatively charged and protons are positively charged. So atoms contain both positive and negative charges. And usually it's in equal amounts. So the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. The positive charge is carried by the proton, while the negative charge is carried by electrons. And the charges on the proton and the electron are, are equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign, of course. And they both have a charge of 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And this is the basic quantity of charge, which means all other charges in nature are multiples of this charge. So whenever you charge a material, uh, you cannot remove half of an electron. You have to remove a whole number of electrons or you have to add a whole number of electrons, which means that the charge of any material is going to be a certain number of the electronic charge. And so this fundamental electronic charge is very important, is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And the coulomb is the SI unit of charge. So here is a question. How many electrons are required to make one coulomb of charge? So when we hear the number one, we may think it's a small amount of charge. But I'm going to show you that one coulomb of charge is actually a, a big quantity of charge. Because the number of electrons required to give a material one coulomb of charge is extremely high. It's a one divided by the charge of the electron. One divided by the charge of the electron gives us 6.25 times 10 to the 18 protons. So if you want to charge a material by one coulomb, you have to remove 6.25 times 10 to the power 18 electrons. Now let's look at uh, the conservation of charge, uh, which I had already explained. Charges cannot be created or destroyed. 
uh, and they can only be moved from one object to the other. So if you remove electrons, it becomes negative, uh, it becomes positively charged. If you add electrons to a material, it becomes negatively charged. So that's the law of conservation of charge. Now, an object can be charged in three ways. Number one, by friction. Number two, by contact with a charged object. And number three, by induction. I'm going to explain these three clearly. First, let's look at charging by friction. Now, charging by friction is rubbing one material with another material. For example, if you rub a glass rod with silk, silk has a greater affinity for electrons. So, some of the electrons from the glass rod will be transferred into silk, which makes the glass rod positively charged and the silk equally negatively charged because the silk gained electrons and the glass rod lost electrons. So basically that is charging by friction. In this case you can see this child moving on a, a plastic slide and which causes <coughs> excuse me the child's hair to stand on end and that's because when the child is moving there is friction between his body and the slide and some of the electrons are stripped away from the body of the child and so that makes him positively charged and so now all the hairs on his head are positively charged and so they repel each other we do know that like charges repel unlike charges attract so that's a clear Here's another example. Uh, in this example, you have amber that is uh, rubbed with a piece of silk. And then the amber gains electrons while the silk loses electrons. So the amber becomes negatively charged while the silk, having lost electrons, becomes positively charged. That's charging by friction. And this is a simplified model of an atom where you have the nucleus and inside which you have the protons and the neutrons, while outside the atom we have the negatively charged electrons revolving in particular orbit, orbits. And in order to test if an, if an object is charged, we can use what's called the electroscope. The electroscope is basically made up of an, an object, a metal, with a metal rod and a sphere at one end, and at the end of which traditionally you had two gold leaves, very thin gold leaves. And this whole thing is insulated and protected in a chamber so that air does not carry away the charges. So that's a gold leaf electroscope. Now if you bring a positively charged object near the sphere, this is positively charged and so the electrons in the gold leaf get attracted and they move towards the sphere, making this end negatively charged which means the gold leaves are now positively charged because the electrons moved away. And since both the leaves are positively charged, they repel each other, showing that this object is charged. On the other hand, if the positively charged object is really put in contact with the sphere, not brought close, but actually brought in contact with it, uh, since this object is positively charged, it has lost electrons and so it requires and it's looking for electrons. So what's going to happen here, some of the electrons from this rod, some of the electrons from this rod will be transferred into this object. That again means that 
this whole structure has lost electrons. Once again, making the gold leaves positive, and since both of them are positive, they repel. And then now, if you move the object away, you're going to leave the gold leaves with a permanent positive charge. So here you see a difference between inducing charges. So in, when you induce charges, you don't touch the charged object, but you bring it very close. Uh, on the other hand, in charging by contact, you actually touch the charged object on the gold leaf electroscope. So that's the difference. We'll talk about that in detail. Here, I'm trying to explain charging by Here, induction. I'm trying to explain charging so what's this by carefully? Induction. You have two so uncharged metal spheres that are completely insulated. That so that's insulation insulated. right there. So these so are completely uncharged right so metal spheres. Completely uncharged now, a positively charged sphere now, is brought very close to this sphere on the left side. Very close to this. Very close, but not touching it. Now, because very it's close, positively charged, now because uh, this end, charged, the left end of the left sphere will become negatively the charged the because the electrons will be attracted that way, while the right end of the right sphere will become positively charged since the electrons from there are also moved here. So, you see, all the electrons moved to this point because they're still touching each other, making the left sphere negatively charged. Making and the, the right sphere positively charged. charged. And the right sphere All right. Positively Third charged. step, while still holding the object right, right there, step, while still the two the spheres right are there. separated. You the see, they are separated are while separated. still holding it here. So while now the there is no here. chance for the electrons so that moved on to the left sphere to go back. So, excuse me. So when the <coughs> positively charged object is when now the removed. Positively charged object is now removed. The left sphere is now permanently the left negatively charged, now permanently while the right sphere is positively charged. The right sphere is positively so you see that charged. this is charging by so induction. This is charging by the main induction. thing is you're not touching the, the objects to be charged. So that's charging by induction. To be charged. So that's charging by induction. Here is another method of charging by induction. In this case, uh, there is only one sphere that's again insulated. You bring the positively charged object close to the sphere and the electrons move to the left end, making the left side negative and the right side positive. While still keeping the charged object close, the right side of this object is grounded. So you connect a conductor to the ground. And the ground has a lot of electrons. And immediately when that ground connection is made, electrons from the ground flow into this metal sphere to neutralize the positive charges there. And then, the ground connection is broken. When the ground connection is broken, the right side is neutralized, leaving a negative charge on the left side. And now, in the last step, the positively charged object is moved away. When it's moved away, the negative charges spread out on that sphere. So now we have a negatively charged object. So this is charging by induction using a ground connection. Important thing to remember here is that the ground can give any amount of electrons and can also accept any amount of electrons. Basic law of electrostatics is called the Coulomb's law. And according to this law, if you have two point charges, Q1 and Q2, separated by a distance r, these two charges are either going to attract each other or repel each other depending on the nature of charges. Like if both are negative or both are positive, they will repel each other. But if one is positive, the other is negative, they will attract each other. In both of these cases, the force between them is given by this formula, K 
times q1 times q2 divided by r squared where q1 and q2 are the charges of these two particles or point charges and r is the distance between them k is actually a constant called 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught epsilon naught is called the permittivity of free space permittivity comes from the word permit which shows how much an electric field can go through a material so the permittivity of free space is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 and when you plug in the value into this formula you get 8.99 times 10 to the 9 as the value for k if we're talking about free space or air so using this formula we can calculate uh, the force between any two charges as an example if q1 and q2 both are one coulomb each so both are one and the distance between them is one meter then we're going to get a force of 8.99 times times 10 to the 9 newtons that's pretty simple because all of these numbers become one so f will be equal to k which is 8.99 times 10 to the 9 newtons that's a huge force showing that charge of one coulomb is really big as i mentioned before and that's why there is a huge force between these two charges concept that we need to know about is called the electric field now electric field is represented using electric lines now if it's a positive charge the electric lines go away from it and if it's a negative charge the electric lines come towards it so here you have a positive charge and you see that the electric lines go away from it and actually the number of lines show the strength of the charge so if it's a stronger charge then you have to have more lines coming out of it or the lines would be closer as you can see in this case so here is a positive charge the lines are coming away or going away from it but if it's a negative charge the lines come towards it and here you have a, a bigger negative charge as compared to this one so you have more number of lines coming towards it so that's the idea of an electric field let me now illustrate how to work out problems where you're asked to calculate the electric field so in this diagram you have a plus 10 nano coulomb at that point that's q2 and q1 is plus 5 nano coulombs nano is 10 to the negative 9 okay so you have two positive charges one plus 5 nano coulomb and the other plus 10 nano coulomb and let's say you're asked to find the field at this point O. Whenever you're asked to calculate the electric field, you have to remember that the electric field is defined as the force acting on a plus one coulomb kept at that point. So since we are asked to calculate the electric field at O, we have to imagine that there is a plus one coulomb kept at that point this 10 nanocoulombs which is positive will now repel the plus one coulomb along this line and that's e2 the field created by this plus 10 nanocoulomb similarly the positive 5 nanocoulombs will repel the plus one coulomb here along this line so the plus one coulomb kept here is acted upon by two forces one is e1 which is the repulsion due to the five and the other is e2 which is the repulsion due to the ten and so we need to find the resultant of these two forces 
by using the vector diagram. And now when you complete the parallelogram, you get the total force acting along this direction, which can be calculated. I'm leaving out the math here in order to save time because I'm going to have another video showing specifically how to calculate the electric field due to two or three charges. Field is such an important topic. I just want to reiterate the idea of electric field. So let's say you have a positive charge Q, uppercase Q columns kept here. And you want to find the field at this point, which is R distance away. To find the field, you have to imagine that there is a plus one coulomb kept at that point. Why? Because electric field is defined as the force acting on a plus one coulomb kept at any point. It is the force acting on a plus one coulomb, which is unit. Unit means plus one. So electric field is the force acting on a plus one coulomb positive charge kept at any point. And by Coulomb's law, we're going to get this formula for electric field. Remember, it's K Q1 Q2 by R squared. Now, one of our charges is one coulomb. And therefore, the formula becomes KQ by R squared. That's the formula for intensity. And intensity is represented by E, which is a vector, of course. It's a force. It's a vector. And to find the unit of intensity, we have to go back to the definition. It is the force acting on one coulomb. Therefore, it's going to be newtons per coulomb. Intensity is just the force acting on one coulomb. Therefore, we get the unit as newtons per coulomb. Electric field lines created by bringing two positive charges close to each other. You see that the electric field lines repel. Because the two forces, the positive charges repel, the electric lines now diverge. They push apart. And clearly showing that at this point, there is not going to be any field because you will not have any electric line passing through that point. Now, what about if it's two negative charges? You have the same phenomenon. You have the electric field as shown here. And uh, here you will not have any field. So that's called a neutral point or a null point. What about if you have two opposite charges? Now you have a positive charge and a negative charge. And two opposite charges attract. And so you see that the electric field lines now go from one to the other. Specifically, electric field lines start from a positive charge and end on a negative charge. So they start from there, from the positive, and go to the negative. Look at the direction of the arrows. Electric field lines always go away from a positive charge and go to this diagram represents a metal sphere or a spherical conductor kept in an electric field. Now before the uh, conductor was kept in this field, all these lines were parallel, representing a uniform electric field. All right? But when you put that spherical conductor into that field, see what happens. The charges in the conductor move and they set up an electric field here exactly opposite to the applied field. So that means we're going to get a very important idea here that the total net electric field inside a conductor is zero. There is no electric field inside a conductor that is charged. And I'm trying to explain that using this diagram. 
that if you charge a metal sphere, which is a different case, you charge, imagine that there is a metal sphere and you charge it, the charges will always push out and try to move to the surface, which means the resulting electric field is always going to be perpendicular to the surface, as you can see, at 90 degrees to the surface. And outside the field is exactly similar to the field of a point charge, but inside there will be no field. That's the important point. There is no electric field inside a charged conductor. At almost uniform electric field. You can create a uniform electric field by placing two metal plates, as shown in the diagram, parallel to each other. So you have two metal plates. One is positively charged. The other is negatively charged. And you know that the electric field always goes away from a positive and goes towards a negative. And inside, you can see that the lines are parallel and with equal space between them. That means it sets up an electric field of uniform strength or constant strength. Of course, at the edges, you do not have that constant field. But this is the type of electric field that is set up in a television picture tube or in what's called a cathode ray tube, a cathode ray tube, about which we will talk as we go on. So this is a method of creating a constant electric field. Again, by setting up two parallel plates that have opposite charges. Important concept that we have to know that when you charge a metal sphere, uh, the charges spread out uniformly over its surface. But if it's not a sphere, and if it's uh, shaped this way, where the curvature is uh, different, you know, here it's sharper, then there will be an accumulation of charges where it's more curved. So if you make it sharper, then there will be greater amount of charge at that point. And this concept is used in a lightning arrestor, or which you would find at the top of tall buildings uh, to protect them from being hit by lightning. So the idea is that when clouds pass over tall buildings, since the lightning conductor has a sharp tip, there's going to be induction of charges there, accumulation of charges, and this lightning conductor is connected to the ground by means of cables that are properly insulated from the building. Thereby, the induced charges are safely carried to the ground. So that is uh, the principle of a lightning conductor or a lightning arrestor. I also want to give another application, which is the application of a laser printer or a photocopier. I'm not going to go into the details, but I want to tell you that in the first stage, you have a drum that is electrostatically charged. And, and then the charges are actually transferred to the toner, depending on the image. The toner, uh, as you know, is a tiny particles uh, that stick to, you know, the places where it is more charged and in the shape of a letter or a number. And then finally, the toner that sticks there in that pattern is transferred to the paper. Uh, the paper is preheated and then the paper, the toner sticks to the paper. That's the idea of photocopying. So I hope you understood this chapter where we talked about the type of charges, the electric field, Coulomb's law, and some of the applications. Thank you and good luck.